Good morning and welcome to Los Angeles for day three of the NACTO conference. Hopefully over the last few days you have learned that Los Angeles is a massive region. Um, our county consists of over 88 cities. Our city alone has four million people and covers over 500 square miles of very diverse terrain. We have horse trails, we have Kardashians, we have bike lanes and we have freeways. There is no shortage of infrastructure and challenges. Um, and the range of needs and features can be immensely challenging for our elected leaders. So this morning, we have three members of the Los Angeles City Council. Each one represents 250,000 constituents in distinct corners of the city. They are here to discuss with us the unique and shared experiences in advancing transportation in their districts. And it is my pleasure to introduce you to three of my 18 bosses. We were going to have a fourth this morning, but he heard it was going to rain and assumed that a state of emergency would be declared, so he won't be here. Um, in all seriousness, he did have a family emergency and sends his regrets. So please join me in welcoming council members Nuri Martinez, Marquise Harris Dawson, and Jose Wiesar. Councilmember Nuri Martinez represents the 6th District in the Northeast San Fernando Valley. She was elected to the City Council in 2013 and for many years has been the sole woman in city government. Her district includes the communities of Van Nuys, Lake Balboa, Sun Valley, Panorama City, Arlita, and North Hollywood. She chairs the Energy, Climate Change, and Environmental Justice Committee, is the Vice Chair of the Transportation Committee, and she also sits on the Public Works and Gang Reduction Committee. Councilmember Marquise Harris Dawson was elected to the 8th District in 2015. He represents South Los Angeles from Baldwin Hills to the border of Watts. Neighborhoods include Vermont Knowles, King Estates, and Hyde Park. He is the chair of the Homelessness and Poverty Committee, vice chair of the Planning, Land Use, and Management Committee, and sits on the Economic Development, Housing, Rules, and Personnel and Animal Welfare Committees. Finally, Councilmember Wiesar is the veteran among this crowd, having served on the council since 2005. He represents the 14th district where we are right now. In addition to downtown Los Angeles, his district includes Boyle Heights, El Sereno, Northeast Los Angeles, and Boyle Heights. He chairs the Planning and Land Use Management Committee and sits on rules and economic development committees. So good morning. Um, I'd like to start off by asking you to briefly describe the district that you represent, some of the unique demographics, and some of the um, primary policy concerns relating to transportation in your district. Let's go ahead and start. Good morning. Good morning. It's uh, good to be here uh, very early in the morning on a rainy day in Los Angeles. Um, if you see an Angelino, you should hug them, because uh, normally we stay in when it rains. Um, so my district, uh, I represent the 8th Council District, which is uh, historic South Central LA when, you know, you see something uh, that depicts uh, South Central in a movie or a film, typically it's in uh, the district that I represent. It begins just south of the 10 freeway and goes down to the uh, 105 freeway. Uh, demographically, it is the only district in Los Angeles where the major a majority of people over 18 are uh, African-American, and so it is the historic African-American community uh, in Los Angeles. The uh, class makeup of the district uh, ranges uh, fairly widely uh, from the west side in uh, Baldwin Hills, uh, which is adjoined by View Park and Ladera Heights. Those three neighborhoods together uh, make up the second wealthiest African-American uh, neighborhood anywhere in the entire United States. Uh, and then uh, I have a part of my district that borders Watts uh, and has the zip code 90044, uh, which has the highest participation in the uh, federal poverty program, uh, temporary aid to needy families. And so you have a wide range of uh, um, um, classes. Also, uh, the, the district is the epicenter for foster care. Um, uh, most foster care cases or a disproportionate number of foster care cases come from this part of the city. Uh, and we also have uh, a very, very high number of people who are residents and undocumented, right? And so as policy uh, waxes and wanes and gets hot and cold, it has a direct impact uh, in our district. 
uh, up to what I'll end with, uh, one of the most shocking and troubling things that I saw during my time as a council member uh, after 2016 on the corner of Florence and Normandy, which is famous, uh, for infamous for the place where the 1992 civil unrest uh, took place. Uh, after 2016 election, we saw ICE agents camped out uh, at the intersection of Florence and Normandy, essentially waiting for people to go to work or go to school or try to live their lives. And so that is uh, the 8th District of Los Angeles. Good morning, everyone. I'm Councilwoman Nuri Martinez. Thank you, Jen, for asking us to be here so early in this morning. <laughs> Welcome to Los Angeles. I was, I was kidding around that as soon as it starts sprinkling, I think Los Angelinos think we're on Stormwatch. So this is Stormwatch 2018. So uh, nevertheless, it's, it's a pleasure to be here this morning. I represent um, the San Fernando Valley. Those of you who are not familiar with Los Angeles, there is another part of Los Angeles called the San Fernando Valley yeah. where almost 2 million people live. And I represent that portion of the city of Los Angeles. The communities that I represent are Arlita, Sun Valley, North Hills, Panorama City, Van Nuys, Lake Balboa, and a small portion of North Hollywood. I represent some of the densest communities in the San Fernando Valley. The majority of my constituents are working poor, and the majority of my constituents rely on public transportation to get to work. Uh, in the Northeast San Fernando Valley, which is a portion that I represent, the ridership in the valley comes from my district and travels northwest, where our people are actually going to go work. Our housekeepers, our, our child care providers, and so on, our students are trying to get to work. Um, and so in my district, people don't have the luxury necessarily or can afford uh, a car to get around. They rely on bicycles because that's the only means of transportation for them. Some of the major concerns in the Northeast San Fernando Valley over the years has been that although we vote for these big ticket items or these initiatives and propositions to fund public transportation for the city of Los Angeles, the community that I represent rarely ever, ever gets to enjoy the luxury of a mass transit system that actually serves them. My constituency is the sixth highest um, in ridership in the entire county of Los Angeles, yet we have never met their needs. When we talk about the red line and we talk about the subway system, it literally stops at the entrance of the San Fernando Valley and North, North, North Hollywood, and it never really captures the actual ridership uh, of the community that I represent. So for me, transportation issues um, are something that I grew up with my entire life because we never had a mass transit system that met the needs of my family or myself. I'm a daughter of immigrants. My father um, was a dishwasher for almost 30 years and never drove a day in his life. He would take the bus from my home to the restaurant where he worked six days out of the week at 4 o'clock in the morning and would take the bus every single day back and forth to get to work. And I'm 45 years old and not much has changed for my community. Some of the biggest concerns, Jen, um, that we face is, you know, it's a good thing that we pass Measure M and that we're going to have somewhere around $1.5 billion infrastructure investment coming to the Northeast San Fernando Valley. Some of the concerns, though, are going to be where we actually um, uh, put some of the infrastructure improvements that are not going to meet resistance and nimbyism. I think that's probably one of the biggest concerns in terms of the city council members is have change is difficult for people things are going to come and construction is going to be uncomfortable, but how do you convince people that it is about time for us to get a sensible transportation system in the city and no one push back with some of the NIMBY issues that sometimes our neighbors hurts face? So that's probably one of our biggest concerns and, uh, and we're trying to prepare for that, but nevertheless, we are looking at a $1.5 billion investment coming into my neighborhoods. Thank you. Thanks. <clears throat> well, good morning, everyone. I'm Council Member Jose Huizar. I represent the 14th Council District. The 14th Council District includes downtown Los Angeles, everything within the freeway system from the 10, 110 over to the F Hollywood Freeway. I also represent Ball Heights and Northeast Los Angeles. And downtown Los Angeles right now is very unique in that it's one of the fastest growing center cities anywhere in the country. 
Uh, 10 years ago, we had about 10,000 people who called downtown home. Today, we have 75,000 people who live in downtown. And it's projected that by the year 2040, we will have an additional 140,000 people who live in downtown. That's on top of the half a million people who come to downtown every day to work. Half a million people come here and leave here. So as you can see, that presents some very unique challenges for us where we built down the downtown Civic Center as a very car-centric area uh, over the years. And now as we are attempting to make this a place where people live and we're attempting to bring more public amenities and keep families here and keep the economic development going, uh, we are looking to provide um, multi uh, different ways of transportation for people who call downtown home or work here. Uh, as we look at what we're doing now, uh, we are attempting to create a downtown that prioritizes walking, biking, or scootering uh, as much as we've uh, prioritized cars over the years. And you see that in several of the projects that we are doing, such as My Fig, the Main Street and Spring Street uh, new um, protected bike lanes we're doing. Uh, they, we are working to also uh, create new uh, expanded sidewalks wherever we can additional bike lanes, so we are in that mode right now, but it seems like we are just catching up to the explosion of downtown LA, and that is that just eight years ago, you could literally turn off the light switch in downtown about five, six o'clock, and anyone who did work in downtown left to the suburbs, and not much activity was happening here, but as that activity started to explode, as is happening across the country where people are, are, are uh, revitalizing the civic centers of each city as we we're doing here in LA we're just now catching up to do that uh, but I think the prospects look bright first and foremost we have a Department of Transportation in the city of LA that gets it and it's very different from we had from what we had just eight years ago I recall a time that in Highland Park in the northeast part of my district we had proposed the city's first ever bike corral where we took two parking spots and created parking for bikes and at that time, uh, I hope that person's not here anymore, but they, they, the person from the Department of Transportation told us, you're not taking one inch of our street. Uh, and I think the, the, the thinking, the uh, progressive uh, approach to transportation has really evolved in the city of Los Angeles to now I think we're uh, one of the leaders in, in, in creating active, complete streets. So I want to thank the Department of Transportation in the city of LA. Let's give them a big round of applause. Thank you for the work you do. So our challenge in downtown LA is how do we continue to accommodate the half a million people who come work here, the growing population that calls this home, the visitors we have. In the past, downtown was known mostly for the Bunker Hill area where people came to work, and now the future of downtown is mostly entertainment, more uh, bars, restaurants, um, theaters that are reopening up. Uh, so how do we accommodate that for people who are driving or coming down distances, and also how do we create that last mile? Uh, we are building the underground um, the regional connector, the light rail system that will connect every major light rail in the region. Uh, but as people, we, as we promote that and promote more uh, people to take uh, public transportation, how then do we create that last mile in downtown so that you could get a few blocks and that's our challenge now, right now, that we're trying to think creatively how to do that. In the other part of my district, if you cross the river to the east, uh, you go to Boa Heights, which is a low income area, which is primarily Latino immigrant. And the challenge there is that we have, uh, Boa Heights is considered one of the city's first suburbs. When downtown was growing, when the city of LA was growing, that was one of the first places where people went to move. And so we have very old infrastructure there that quite frankly has been neglected for a long time. So our challenge there is as we're developing new transportation options and uh, improving transportation, how do we work with an, an area that has very um, old infrastructure that sometimes makes it more expensive uh, for us to create the type of uh, innovative transportation modes that we would like to see. Uh, but the rest of my district on that side of the river, northeast of Lambeau Heights, our real challenge is that as people come to work in downtown, people forget there's neighborhoods there. So you have this rush of traffic, of high velocity traffic coming and going every day uh, from people in the San Gabriel Valley way out east to get to downtown. And in the last few years, we've been finding ways to calm traffic down in the major arteries and, and, uh, and um, not get that high volume of traffic just speeding through what are 
essentially neighborhoods. Uh, we've implemented several road diets, uh, and we use bike lanes not so much only to, for the purpose of bike lanes, but also as traffic calming measures. For example, Colorado Boulevard in Eagle Rock where uh, it's another artery people coming to downtown from San Gabriel Valley and other places where we implemented a road diet, we saw that we only reduced, uh, that we saw a, a reduction of traffic collisions by about 40% from one year to the next. <clears throat> and in um, high peak travel times, uh, travel miles per hour only reduced about two to three miles per hour at those times. So it was a great trade-off that we saw. And once we saw that that worked on Colorado Boulevard, we started implementing that in other parts of my district to calm traffic as it's coming to downtown. So thank you so much. Thank you for being here. And thank you for visiting Los Angeles. Come back again. Council members, you explained the very distinct needs of your districts. How do you balance that with working in a, a body that represents 500 square miles that may have um, different needs than your district? Um, I think one way to look at it is equity. Um, I think that uh, the, all three of us um, represent some of the poorest neighborhoods in the city of Los Angeles. And for years, our, our neighborhoods have never gotten its, its fair share of, um, for example, complete streets. Um, some of our districts still don't have the basic infrastructure for people to get around safely in their neighborhoods. You, don't, you have missing sidewalks. You have some of the highest, um, and highest um, injury network corridors of the city of Los Angeles where you have people dying, just having to cross the street to take their children to to, the, to school or having to get to work in our neighborhoods. For example, um, from April of last year to April of this year, we've had 14 fatal accidents in my district alone. 14 people have died as a result of someone running them over, just trying to get to from point A to, to point B. So I think some of the struggles around the council, and it's not that people don't understand this, but we need to be the voice of reason and we need to get to the communities that have been forgotten for decades and decades and decades. And that's our responsibility. We have neighborhoods who don't have basic infrastructures. And then you have other neighborhoods who complain because, you know, you've got too many potholes. But in my neighborhood, we can't even get around during rainy season because we don't have basic infrastructures like sidewalks. So to me, it's really about the haves and the have-nots. And you have to make the argument that we've got... We have to get to these neighborhoods. These, these children are growing in neighborhoods where we've never gotten to them, and we've, we have to do it. We have to do it um, in order to save lives, and so that's been my biggest frustration, but at the same time, I think we have real champions on this council to ensure that we finally get to these neighborhoods. Yeah, I, I think uh, I agree completely with uh, Councilmember Martinez on, on this. Um, what you, at least what I found when I first got on the council was there, there were far more points of unity uh, and neighborhoods in the city were much more alike than uh, you would perceive them sort of on their face. And equity is the big, uh, the, the, the sort of unifying theme, I think, for this council, the mayor, and a lot of the leadership of, of departments. And here's the thing about equity that I will point out, which is why it's so important to have uh, unity on the council on this. Councilwoman Martinez pointed out decades and decades of inequity. Well, you can't undo that in two years or in one budget or two budgets or in a mayoral cycle. It take, like You have to really, really dig in uh, to do the kind of strategic investment. Again, not just you know laying a road down because they got a road so we get a road too. It really has to be examined in a strategic way. And I think, uh, again, I, for me, uh, it's the points of unity that stick out uh, with regard to this particular council and the city leadership at this moment. Uh, two quick points. One is on the issue of equity and how we balance that is that uh, we have to get away uh, from dividing resources by equally 15. There are some districts with greatest need, and although most would agree, well, yeah, of course we should do it in greatest need and not divide it, but you find within policies that haven't been looked at at a very long time that we're still dividing resources by 15 when there are some di districts or some areas of the city that haven't gotten the attention because of the lack of resources. Uh, that, that's on equity. Uh, but also our biggest challenge, I think, is our, uh, the city of LA is very different. Even my own district, you look at downtown versus Ball Heights versus Eagle Rock. Eagle Rock, a bit more affluent, middle class. 
Um, and, and how do you accommodate, not so much on the income level, but different ideas of what makes good transportation policy? For example, we adopted a, a master plan for our, our bicycle network in the city. And we find that some people are picking off what areas we should take out, what areas we should put in. Uh, and, and it's not only in a, a difference in the city in terms of income, but you know, beliefs as to what makes better transportation in the city. And that's always a challenge because although we could say, hey, we all support this bicycle master plan uh, network, uh, the master plan for bi our bicycle network, we believe in it. And then throughout the time we're picking off here, we're picking off there, or we're, we're constantly, um, I have different ideas throughout the city of, of what makes sense or not. And it's, it's natural that that would happen in a, in a democratic government. The focus on Vision Zero is a um, significant departure from moving vehicles as quickly as possible throughout our city. Um, and you three have been tremendous advocates for the Vision Zero program. Um, and on behalf of the department, thank you. Um, but I'm curious if you could talk about who have been supporters in your communities and where there have been unexpected wins or resistance and, and how you've confronted that. Oh, I think the, the Vision Zero um, debate on the council has also been, I don't want to air our dirty laundry, but I'm going to do it anyways. Uh, <laughs> part, of the, part of, you know, preventing people from dying on our streets has to also be, we need to put our money where our mouth is. Yeah. And I think that at times we like to talk about Vision Zero and this concept of reducing deaths on our streets. But every time it comes to this budget debate about how much money we're going to invest in Vision Zero, we end up at zero. And so, and we, then we have to fight for every square inch um, of our districts and a couple of other members who are not here because 14 people who died in the course of a year is completely unacceptable. For anyone and anywhere in this country, no one should have to die on their way to school. And so to me, the, thank you. So to me, the, 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 the priorities of this council has to be, you can't get up and call a press conference and talk about how you're going to reduce deaths by 2025 and not really put the money behind that. And so for me, we, we started to push and we started to look at the high uh, injury network. And I have, for example, I've got plenty of those in my district, but on Roscoe Boulevard, for example, it is the most dangerous, Van Nuys and Roscoe Boulevard in Panorama City is the most dangerous intersection in the entire San Fernando Valley. Because of the number of, of fatalities and the number of hit and misses and the number of people that have uh, gotten into accidents there. So we began to do street reconstruction, restriping left, um, left signal turns, sidewalk improvements. All of this adds to the notion that we need to complete our streets in order for people to get from point A to point B safely. So to me, the biggest hiccup every time we talk about Vision Zero is we can all pat ourselves on the back and say, yes, we are all champions for Vision Zero, but when are we going to get serious about funding it to the levels that it should be so that we can stop having to report on another fatality in, in any of our districts? That's the real question. I second uh, Ms. Martinez's motion. <laughs> on fully funding uh, Vision Zero. So I, I, you know, I think she makes the point uh, very, very clearly. Uh, and again, one of the biggest surprises with, with being on council was, you know, I, I came in representing South LA. I've been an activist in South LA for all my adult life. And so you always think of, you know, gangs and homicides as, you know, the big public health crisis and issue that has to be confronted. And certainly that is an issue that has to be confronted. Little did I know that the uh, traffic fatalities were competitive with gun violence. Uh, and depending on the month, uh, the traffic fatalities could be higher. Um, and uh, like the sixth council district in the Valley, we have some of the most dangerous corridors. You know, the Western and Slauson, which most of you who are not from here have never heard of, and there's no reason why you would know it was there is second only to Hollywood and Highland, which many of you probably do know about because that's where they have the Oscars uh, every year. So that's the most uh, tricky intersection in terms of injuries and, and deaths. Western and Slauson second. It's in the middle of South LA. There's no reason for that. It's just, it just makes no sense. But the response, like how quickly we can get that dealt with 
um, really, really lags. And one of the reasons it lags is because of funding and prioritizations. The city's always in a struggle between the, it, there's always a struggle, sometimes spoken, sometimes unspoken, between the haves and the haves not, have nots. <coughs> there's also a battle between are investments designed to create financial return or are they designed to create quality of life return? And we, uh, all of us are constantly fighting for the quality of life of the residents of our districts who've never, uh, at least not in our lifetimes, have gotten what they've deserved or gotten a return on the investments that they make in the city. I certainly welcomed uh, Vision Zero um, as a concept into my district when it was announced because when I was elected back in 05, 06, <clears throat> we were looking for traffic calming measures, as I mentioned, from people traveling from the east side into downtown and uh, forgetting there's neighborhoods there. We are trying different ways of just cobbling money and making things happen, but now there's a, 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 a conceptual framework of what's possible uh, to make our streets even safer. Now, as was mentioned, even though we were, we've been trying to implement some of these ideas, it, it doesn't come without challenges. Earlier, I mentioned the road diet we did on Colorado Boulevard in Eagle Rock. Well, it was a real battle, so to speak, uh, between communities who wanted the bike lanes and others who didn't. And although we talked about how we're going to put other traffic calming measures, um, such as uh, pedestrian head start signals, curb extensions, flash, flash signals, um, there was this real just disdain for additional bike lanes because we're going to take a additional lane of traffic away. And so although we have these, these um, ideas that we know that can work and we're, we're, we all have the same goal, which is to calm traffic down and make it safer, um, every maybe, uh, you know, every major road drive we've tried to implement in our district coming from the east side have not gone without their battle. So it's been huge challenges, not only a funding issue, but also changing people's ideas about what's possible. But I think at the end of the day, we, we've all had the, the same goal in mind. It's just about how you go about it. But it, it's been some challenges to implement some of these ideas. Thank you. I'd now like to change our focus to talk about transportation technology. Um, we've had a lot of discussions over the last couple of months in every committee about dockless bike share. Oh, um, I, I don't want to talk about that, but I would like to hear from you <laughs> um, about what role you see private companies having in providing mobility. Um, do you think that there's a role to coexist? Do you think there's a replacement? Where do you see the future going with transportation technology in the Los Angeles transportation system? Well, I mean, I, I will uh, leave uh, the answer to that to my colleagues, but what I will say as a, as a overarching principle uh, about private business, businesses providing what is basically a necessity, especially in a place like Los Angeles, transportation is, equity is a big issue in the government, it's an even bigger issue in the private sector, right? So discrimination and, and redlining and disinvestment are all legal. They're completely legal and in fact they're encouraged, right? The better you can say, I'm going to pick out the places where I'm going to make money and eliminate the places where I won't make money, the better you are at raising capital. Uh, and so I think our role is to really uh, hold these, uh, all of these private interests accountable to uh, building an equitable infrastructure. So you can't just put scooters over here and not over there. You can't just have, uh, you can't make it so your, your, your ride share people can eliminate riders who are going to certain neighborhoods or coming from certain neighborhoods. That's the role that we have to play uh, in the government because without that, uh, we know what the private sector will produce on its own. So um, the only thing I will say about dockless bikes and scooters is that they're not necessarily impacting my district right now because let's be honest, they don't really want to be in my district. What's, what's, what, what, where these companies would like to be at is, is downtown, uh, LA and Hollywood because that's the market that they're actually uh, aiming to. So what I did into the transportation committee with, with the assistance of Mike Bonin who's not here this morning is to push for incentives to make these companies come into communities of color or else they're not going to come. So that's one uh, area that we think we need to be pushing for um, as well. And then the other thing is aesthetically, you know, 
neighbors don't want to have to deal with bicycles that are just left in, in, the, in the public right of way. People don't want to have to deal with scooters that are just left abandoned in the, in the middle of the public right of way. So we also have to do our due diligence so that it doesn't become a problem for our offices to have to go pick up bikes and scooters that people don't know where to park. And so for me, it's two things. It's to make these companies go into communities of color, um, and not only into the downtown area in Hollywood, and also ensure that they pick up their mess after they're done, that they're just not making money off of our writers, but that they're not gonna leave a mess there because guess who's gonna get the phone call? It's my office who's gonna get the phone call. If they ever come to my district, I'm still debating whether that's actually gonna happen or not. But I know that for some areas in the city, that seems to be a huge issue, is what do you do with these abandoned scooters after you're done using them? So that's as much as I can tell them. Thank you. Aside from the equity issue, I welcome uh, the private sector getting more involved in transportation, uh, particularly in the area of downtown, um, whether it's for capital investment or operations of whatever transportation modes we have. For example, we are working on getting a streetcar back to downtown Los Angeles, and we are on the cusp uh, to, we, well, we have presented a plan to uh, Metro to adopt that's uh, being reviewed at this time, and the way we're going to be able to um, uh, get the investment we meet, need to make that happen is that given where public dollars are so scarce and we're investing heavily on light rail and really the concept of streetcar is not a high priority for the region, uh, we've been having to scramble around where we find funding and we will propose a public-private partnership to make it possible uh, to complete the streetcar. So from the capital side, I, I welcome it to uh, find those scarce dollars uh, where we could continue moving with some innovative public transportation projects. On the operations side, uh, the private sector is a bit more innovative, creative, uh, that wants to really push uh, the envelope on what's possible. And uh, you know, the natural resistance from government is to say, hey, wait a minute, you're moving too fast. Um, and which is the case with scooters, et cetera. We need regulations in place first before we uh, have them all over the place. But I like that. I like the fact that the private sector is pushing the envelope, asking us to think differently, asking us to think ahead, asking us to plan ahead. And particularly when it comes to elected leadership, you know, now in the era of term limits, we're there just a few years. Um, it's incumbent upon us to start thinking long term and, and not just in the short term and how we accomplish things now. So um, I, I welcome the private sector here in downtown, for example, we have congestion parking where we can use an app and find parking uh, spots that are available that uh, prevents people from driving around trying to find a parking spot, which is, uh, has, uh, has created more traffic than actually from getting from point A to point B. Um, we're also uh, implementing some other uh, ways to use um, apps to uh, find um, the nearest uh, and fastest way to get around no matter what transportation mode you're, you're, you're using. So I welcome it. Thank you so much. I hope that you have all enjoyed visiting Los Angeles and that you've seen that there is so much more to our city than just cars and traffic congestion. Um, I'm wondering if any of the council members have any parting remarks for our visitors to Los Angeles, something that they can take with them. Uh, welcome to Los Angeles. Thank you all, uh, all for being here. Uh, I just, uh, what I would say to all of you is, is watch us uh, and comment on what's happening. We've got the biggest public investment in transportation of any big city uh, and some of the biggest private investment. Uh, you know, as we talk about scooters and car shares, you know, there's a guy building a tunnel for a train just uh, south of uh, the southern border of my district uh, named Elon Musk. He says he can do a train faster than anybody underground uh, and is tunneling at this moment. Uh, so I think he, there will be a lot to see in Los Angeles going forward. Uh, some of it will be great and some of it we will fall on our face, but I think all of us are committed to building the kind of uh, future and the kind of community that all of our, our residents deserve. I just don't want you to walk away hating LA. <laughs> I think that's my mission. <laughs> I was born and raised in this city. I've never left. I chose to stay here and raise my family. I love this city. I think one of the, the, the pride and joys when I travel and talk about our city and our respective districts is the fact that we're so diverse and that we're so inclusive and that we're one of the most progressive councils in the nation. 
We pride ourselves that we do look out for people. We pride ourselves on increasing the minimum wage in Los Angeles. We pride ourselves in some of the most innovative transportation projects in the entire world. These are all really good things. We're not saying we're perfect. We have to get more women elected to the city council, by the way. Um, we're falling short on that. But we're the most diverse city council, the most progressive city council <clears throat> in the country. And we pride ourselves because we work so closely together. Nevertheless, we have a lot, of, a lot of hiccups along the way. We have a lot. Look around. I mean, our homeless issue is out of control. But we come from at it from a humane perspective. These are all Angelinos. We have to take care of one another. But most importantly, I think I want you to take away from Los Angeles is thriving. Uh, we are very proud of the city that we're becoming. And we're going to make it even better for our children. Thank you. Los Angeles is redefining itself, and we are at that uh, place where we are just setting the foundation of the new Los Angeles, and transportation is going to be critical to how future generations uh, are using uh, our roads, are using our public spaces. But I do think that as we're setting that foundation, uh, we are thinking more inclusively now where we're, even in the designs, for example, in downtown as we're designing our new buildings, we want to open them up. Um, there was a time here in the 90s when we were, for example, in downtown building our buildings that were kind of insular. <laughs> we wanted to keep the elements out. And now as we're looking to the future, I, we're appreciating public spaces more. We're trying to create more public spaces. We're trying to get away from the singular car tra uh, transportation mode. So I think as we're setting the foundation, we are being progressive in that way. Um, but as we're, as we're moving forward, I, I also think that um, the equity issue will always be in play. One thing, like I mentioned earlier, is that there's internal like policy issues that we often don't see that are hidden in uh, inequities while we're thinking that we're moving in the right direction. So I'm glad where we are as a city, we're setting the foundation, and transportation, what we're doing now is going to be critical to having that more inclusive Los Angeles in the future. Thank you so much. If everyone can stick around, we're going to um, be going towards our walkshops.